Hello and welcome to the innovation session. Uh, so my name is Johanna Kjærstedt. I'm innovation manager at Yeti Manufacturing in CLC North. And uh, I will start by introducing the innovation team mission uh, to you. So we are working towards crafting a community that will turn manufacturing industry into a carbon negative, green and socially inclusive sector. Of course, we do this through our innovation projects of which you had a selection in the previous session. But there are also some other ways um, that we are working on nurturing the community that we will discuss today. So for the agenda of today, uh, we will have an introduction by Klaus Beetz, who is the CEO of, you know, uh, of EIT Manufacturing, of course, but he's also the interim innovation director. Then we will have the, uh, the ways that we are working on the community with uh, Nina and Cecil introducing Agora and Shape It. Then we have two very interesting keynotes, Professor Robin Tegland from Chalmers and Dr. Tamara uh, Charlton. And then we will have a panel discussion with the two keynotes and with Klaus. So welcome and Klaus now, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Johanna, for the introduction. And uh, uh, hello to everybody all over Europe and beyond to uh, uh, our innovation session here. And I want to say uh, uh, I'm very pleased uh, to kick off this session. And uh, we had uh, at the main stage four project presentations now out of the 24 we supported this year. And I strongly recommend uh, to go to the expo area and visit also the other 21, because it was a very, very tough decision, believe me, uh, for us to, to choose the four ones that will be presented on the main stage. So also the other four are very, very interesting. And I am very proud, I must say, that in quite a few of these innovation projects, startups are involved that we already in our second year were able to generate win-win situation for established industries and startups. For the established industry, get in touch with the startups, get inspired by new technologies, by the entrepreneurial spirit, and for the startups, of course, having new potential customer, getting tested their technologies, their products in real use cases in established industry. So this is really, I think, a great achievement I want to mention here. And besides managing and supervising and guiding this 24 projects, which is the main activity of the innovation team, we also launched Agora, the social network and innovation platform. And for a presentation on that, I would like to hand over to Nina. Thanks very much, Klaus, and hi, everyone. So I uh, will tell you a little bit more about Agora. It's our big bet to improve pan-European collaboration among those working in the manufacturing field or studying at graduate level. And uh, Agora is the online meeting point now for the EIT manufacturing community, and we hope over time the wider European industry. And since we opened the platform in June, we have already nearly 700 members and are growing every day. Um, so we see Agora as bringing together the best of LinkedIn teams or Zoom and various office systems you may use. Uh, we haven't seen anything like it at the European scale for the manufacturing industry at least. But why should you take time out of your busy day to join? In a recent survey of our community, 70% said the key benefit they see of joining Agora was to network and build the community. And indeed, 
Agora gives this opportunity to connect and broaden your network with relevant people in your field, and it provides the space to discuss and share ideas, challenges, and solutions directly with peers who are also focused on innovating for a better and greener manufacturing industry in Europe. And Cecile, my colleague, will talk a little bit later about Shape It as an example of this. And uh, now security and privacy has also been very important to us when setting up Agora. And we want everyone to feel comfortable connecting to and sharing on Agora. And that's why we carefully review all um, requests to join to make sure that they are manufacturing related. The platform is also fully GDPR compliant and it's hosted in Europe with the highest certification from ANSI, which is the French cybersecurity agency. So I hope that uh, builds your trust in the, the platform. Finally, one of the reasons we set up Agora is that we've heard the requests from partners that they want to have more ways to hear about what's going on within EIT manufacturing and new ways to get involved and connect. So Agora is built around groups and services called Spheres, and we have dedicated spheres for our pillars and CLCs to help you stay updated and find new ways to get involved. But we've also created some special services like Industry and Tech Watch, where we curate successful technology use cases. And there's actually a survey going on right now where you can share your views on what else you'd like to hear about. There's also Bottle at Sea, uh, where members can find potential solutions to their industrial challenges. And we've already had quite a few solutions found, so, so do check that out. And on Agora, you can also access the EAT manufacturing tech radar that you can see on the screen. It's, uh, it's an interactive uh, radar where, that looks at four big industry trends and the 40 defining technologies of that. And there is more to come. Our Tuesdays from Future Innovation webinar series has been running for half a year now, and the recordings and materials are available on Agora. Uh, we'll soon show you an intro video so you learn a little bit more about, about this series, but you can already sign up for our next session, which is on cybersecurity on December 7th, so next week. And we're continuously developing new services and always want to hear views from our community. So in our pipeline, we plan, for example, to provide opportunities to look for and find short or long-term experts on specific topics or help organizations identify new EU funding to access as well as build a community around green and circular trends, which, uh, which we know is of significant importance and has come up in several discussions. And if you're already running a community or an EIT manufacturing project and want to benefit from our already set up pan-European infrastructure, then we'd really be happy to hear from you. So, so do reach out. Um, finally, our ambition, as you may have gathered from this presentation is that we want to become the reference community for the European manufacturing industry in the coming years. And so we do want to make it as useful and valuable for you all as possible. So my question to you is, will you join us? You can request to join at agora-eatmanufacturing.eu. Now I will show you a brief video about Tuesdays from future and then Cecile will show more about our consultation process, shape it. After looking at the landscape of manufacturing with the combined experience and expertise in the field of Industry 4.0, EIT Manufacturing Community identified emerging topics with potential for transversal and wide-scale effects in the near future. Tuesdays from Future is an innovation webinar series where leading experts present and discuss the latest insights on real-life use cases, forthcoming scientific achievements and new technologies, 5G including Edge and Edge AI, Cybersecurity and Factory 4.0, the role of blockchain in manufacturing, carbon footprint reduction, circular economy, and many more. Hungry for more? Interested in white papers, tech radar, or designing your own webinar? Head over to Agora, our open innovation platform. EIT Manufacturing, making innovation happen. Contact us at innovation at eitmanufacturing.eu.
so the video gives you a good idea of uh, what we have already um, done on Agora. Now I want to tell you about Shape It. It's a collaborative consultation process involving the whole manufacturing community. And the goal is to define our future core thematics. So the process was done in three steps, running from September to November. And everything uh, was done on Agora. The first step was idea generation for three weeks. The idea here is, is for participants to interact, discuss, and find out what are the manufacturing priorities. The second step is the hotspot creation. That was for four weeks, where participants could propose a hotspot um, thematic. They had to fill in a canvas and also involve other members to work with them. And the final step was the thematic selection. So we had uh, several ways to evaluate the hotspot. Uh, and I will tell you more about that in the next slide. And the very end of the process is the final decision, which was uh, done in November. So what are the outcome and result of the Shape It process? The first step, idea generation. We had over 250 participants, 12,000 visits, and over 1,000 comments and likes. So I think a great success showing attracting people to Agora and having them engaged. The second step about hotspot creation, our target was to get 10 to 15 proposal of hotspots, and we had 16 generated. 13 organizations were involved and 41 hotspot team members. So again, here showing a good mobilization of the community. The final step was the hotspot and thematic selection. We had one evaluation was the social vote and we had almost 400 votes. So, and people were keen to participate. Then we also did a peer-to-peer -peer evaluation and EITM also did an evaluation of the, the hotspot. The next step is a mapping. So we made sure that the shortlisted uh, thematics were covering all the strategic objectives. And then the final selection was submitted to the steering committee for the, the, the validation and also to the management team of EIT manufacturing. So we will now share with you what are the four thematics selected for the call for proposal 2023. They're shown here on the right. And in the center here, we show the existing flagships that we have been using so far. And you can see that the thematics are clearly linked to the flagship. They are kind of renew viewpoint and specifying the flagship. The first one, the, the first thematic is automation for the human-centered factories. The second one is collaborative robots and solutions for flexible manufacturing. The third one, smart technologies for circular and green manufacturing. And the last one is AI and digital twins for manufacturing systems. So this would be the basis for the core for proposal 2023. So, now we will tell you the next step. So really stay tuned. Uh, we will open a new sphere on Agora dedicated to the core for proposal 2023. So you can continue the discussion starting during Shape It. And also you can get information on the key da dates and steps for the core for proposal process. The, we will organize ideation sessions around each core thematics in January next year. And this will be followed by a matchmaking event on the 8th and 9th of February. So I would like to say thank you for your attention. And here, if you just take a mobile phone, you can scan this QR code and directly have access to Agora. Thank you, Cecile for this presentation. I think it has been giving a good overview of the work that we have ongoing and what we are doing to build this community. Now, we will have another 
exciting presentation by Professor Robin Tegland. She is coming from Stanford and the US and through Norway to Sweden and is now professor at Chalmers University of Technology and also co-founder of Penish Ocean Watch. Please, uh, Robin, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much. And first of all, I'd like to thank you all for such a fantastic opportunity uh, to come and speak, both about my research uh, as well as about my work as an entrepreneur, as an engaged scholar. So let's go ahead and get started. I know we're short on time. I will share my screen now. Um, as Johanna mentioned, I am a professor of management and digitalization at Chalmers. Uh, feel free to take whatever you see here. Uh, you know, I put up my slides at SlideShare, so steal with pride. Let's see, let's move on. Um, what do I really focus on? It's about this. It's about trying to understand the future. And clearly we will never know what the future holds, but we can develop a shared understanding, a collective understanding, and we need to discuss the future. I kind of like to ask all of you, how many of you actually had discussed, say, the pandemic that we've been going through prior to its happening, prior to any indications or signals that this might be going on? This is our challenge. How do we make strategic choices about tomorrow and say the future of manufacturing when we have such really little information about what might be happening? I mean, what we don't know, we don't know is a huge piece. But what's important here is also thinking about what assumptions do we take for granted? Because looking forward, we can also look back and think about how basic assumptions about how we organize the way we live, the way we work, the way we create value through manufacturing, how have these been challenged? It's only a couple hundred, few hundred years when we were living on self, in self-sustaining communities, making things ourselves very much or for our neighbor. Quickly moving in though, into this first industrial revolution where we started moving into cities, manufacturing changing the trans of our society and how we lived. And if we think on with the second industrial revolution, moving in to say this multinationals that we see today and take for granted with where we think about, you know, reducing uh, unit costs, scale, economies of scale, et cetera. But what about moving forward? And here we're already in this third and fourth industrial revolution where we're seeing lights out mines and lights out factories, 3D printing and industrial size and so on. But I'd like to ask the question, what does this mean then for say the way we live and work and how does society influence life by this and how do we influence back? Well, many see a future scenario where we might be living say in these what's called regen villages as one company has termed it, or these sustainable communities, self-sustaining through say 3D printing of food, making things locally, renewables, access to education and work through the internet. When you look at this, you think about what about the future of mobility? Will we be still be making those cars that we saw previously? We don't know what the future holds. Now, while on the one hand, we see all of these lovely positive scenarios, I'd also like to say, we're also, as we know, as we just saw in say the four thematic areas, we are very much challenged by a huge number of global issues. We have issues such as migration. We have lots of externalities from manufacturing. These are also signals of the future or signals from the periphery of the future, one could say, where on the left-hand side, this is supposedly a project in China where they want to build a city on the top of a great global garbage patch and use this waste as energy. Or what about on the right hand side where you're seeing you know, science fiction become science fact as we see more and more cities being over um, polluted and, and inhabitable, inhabitable due to pollution or changes in the climate. And here you might recognize Blade Runner here. Another signal say, signaling this is say these a lot of tech billionaires moving uh, or looking about how they could move to outer space. So the question I put to you when we're talking about the future of manufacturing is, who will create our future, right? Who creates the future? Well, you all know the answer, we all do. We have to be the future we want to see. We have to make those changes ourselves, but then we come back to this challenge. How do we make these strategic decisions when we have such a you know, huge amount of unknown unknowns? Well, again, this is very much about discussing, bring it up, and this is why I very much like seeing this Agora and this, this discussion platform. We need to bring this unconscious 
uh, kind of individual visions of the future to the surface where we discuss in a collective. And when we're doing that, I think it's very important to be challenging and looking for opportunities. But this is also a challenge, right? The future is best found in the opportunities that go unnoticed in the present. So how do we find these opportunities? Well, one of our hugest challenges is something that we call exploitation exploration. Exploitation is doing all the things right. And this is how most of us, and I'd say in most companies, organizations, the way we work. We do what we're already doing a little bit cheaper, a little bit faster. We get that product to market a little bit you know, faster, quicker, maybe a little bit higher quality. But we're still doing the same thing. So the question becomes, are we doing the right things? And I think this is what exploration is about. And now today, with all the new technologies coming, with the focus on circular economy, with the ability to combine and converge various technologies, we saw the blockchain. What about virtual worlds in this metaverse that's making a return? We have NFTs that might serve as some type of, say, payment form within, or maybe we can experiment with designing things in the virtual before taking them into the physical. We have robots, we have AI, et cetera, et cetera. I think the challenge here is where to start. And I'd like to challenge all of you to take that step back and think about your own networks. What do they look like? Do you build bridges to networks that are very different than your own, diverse networks? This is where innovation comes from. And this is where really radical and transformational or innovation can come from to help us solve our global challenges. So now I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes talking about how I personally have tried to become very much of an engaged scholar breaking out of my traditional academic networks. And I ended up in Peniche, Portugal. It's about one hour north of, of Lisbon, surfing. There's a picture of, my, of me with my son. Now, when you see this photograph, generally you think about focusing on the surfers, but take a step back. Look at the people in the background, but you don't see them, but look at the buildings. Think about Peniche. Who lives in Peniche in this coastal community, similar to coastal communities across the world? Well, it's locals. And I asked them, what will their life look like as we see more and more automation, artificial intelligence, digital transformation, smart cities? What will their life look like? So we started exploring this together with my, some family members, my partner, my son, my daughter. And what we found is that, you know, these coastal communities are hugely challenged. So we thought, could we take a step and start with, say, social sustainability? Let's not focus on the ocean in terms of solving the challenge of the ocean, but could we take a step and say, do, could we directly influence social sustainability? How do we do this? Well, here's just a quick little thing, a quick little exercise, like all of you to engage in. I'd like to see you read one line out loud together. Simple thing, very simple. Okay, here we go. This has to do with your mindset. Let's go. Okay, opportunities are, where are those opportunities? Are they nowhere, which many of you might have seen? Or are the two opportunities now here? It all depends on how you look at things. And I think what we've very much seen in developing this, our Panish Ocean Watch initiative, is that there are a huge number of potential opportunities. But it's the mindset. And here comes the whole aspect of collaboration and building across diverse networks. So if we come up with this nice design thinking statement, how might we empower coastal communities to take back their future. What if we were to start there instead of exploitation? And so we've looked into this and what we've been doing is creating something, a blue circular economy model. There's more information on our homepage. Just gonna give you a couple things that I find relevant to today's discussion. First is how do we work with those people, the users? To what degree do we involve users into the process, especially if we are taking a systemic perspective, a holistic perspective? We've been working very, very closely with the local fishermen, and there you can see them working in different activities, also the divers, the people in the tourism industry. But what are we actually doing? Well, if one of the first projects we came up was a project where we're helping the fishermen fish more sustainably. Now, if we think about exploitation, you would want to make that boat a little bit faster, maybe that engine using a little bit less diesel and so on. But what if we were to take a step back and say, could we design a drone reconnaissance system that's enabled through AI that could go out and search first for fish and maybe have an echo sounder that also could use AI to locate sustainable fishing schools? And this is something that I think we very much can think differently. Then all of a sudden, what are we manufacturing? The question then becomes, how do we manufacture? And this is also what, you know, how are we doing and through what? 
And so here we are, what we found is that fishermen, as they are limited by a quota system, they have tremendous number of hours free, potentially they could devote to other things. So why not collect this resource that they today is thrown away? Fishing nets, tons of fishing nets are produced every year. Could we turn this waste into a valuable resource? So here we're working with developing systems for grinding down these nets and turning them into pellets. What will we do with the pellets? Well, again, think circular, right? How can we use new technologies? And clearly it's about thinking and using, could we use large scale additive manufacturing? So this is happening at Skultur's headquarters in Sweden, manufacturing using fishing nets. What are we manufacturing? I'll just show quickly, this is something that just came hot off the presses, a 3D printed chair made out of fishing nets. It's been done by my daughter and her company. It also then takes that step back. Could we then think differently about how and where, where are we doing this? Well, why not create a circular factory where on the one side nets come in, maybe we think with new materials, these hybrid nano composites, right, combining in graphene. And while we're at it, what are we producing? Well, why not thinking about producing 3D printed uh, electric motors out of these new forms of hybrid plastics? This is all in the works. We have all the tools at our fingertips to do this. So we have a grand goal, Silicon Valley of Ocean Tech with European values though. If anybody would like to help us out, we're, we're here and we'd love to share and, and work together. But this is very much what I wanted to share with you. If you'd like to learn more, there's on, you can just Google and you'll find it. And with that, I'm now part of your network. So if you love knowledge, please uh, set it free and collaborate and share. That's the, truly the only way we will be able to solve our global challenges and create the future that we want. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robin, for this wonderful presentation. I really like your, um, uh, the, the, the word that you were saying, opportunities are now here. And of course, I read it, opportunities are nowhere, I have to admit. But we have to look at things from new perspectives. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you are 3D printing uh, from ocean plastics, you might be aware of one of the projects from EIT Manufacturing is supporting with the, the software mm -hmm. so that you can print better. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. I look Thank forward to learning much more. So. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Now the next speaker will be uh, Dr. Tamara Carlton, who is the CEO, CEO and co-founder of Innovation Leadership Group. And she will do an exciting presentation on moon shoots. Yes, very glad to be here with everyone and talking about one of my favorite topics, building moon shots. And what I thought I might do is go into a little bit about what is it? What are some examples? And how has this been something that we've been really um, working on in humanity? So the general idea of Moonshot has a number of components. One, this is more than a stretch goal. It's often almost impossible to achieve. And our perspective is these are big ideas with big impact. They're intending to make the world a better place. This is also a longer journey. It takes time to achieve. There is a fair amount of often money, resources, energy that go into pursuing a moonshot. And you can see here on your screen, there's multiple phases where you invent, you launch, you reinvent. And this often relies on a scientific or technological breakthrough to really make this happen. Now, if we wind back in history, moonshots is a modern term, and yet people have been trying to achieve these big goals for centuries. So some of you may be familiar with the Longitudinal Act. And actually, if you go back to the mid 1500s, Spain, which I believe was uh, then part of France, posted a challenge to the world and said, we have an almost impossible goal. We're looking to measure longitude out on the open seas for ships. How can you figure out where are you in the world? And of course, this is back in the mid 1500s where you didn't have the same level of technology that you have today. Well, guess what? A lot of these efforts failed and it was a huge need and inventors got involved, 
government groups, different businesses, entrepreneurs. And by the 1700s, the UK actually passed a longitudinal act and that preceded several other acts. And finally, there was a huge breakthrough. So this took several centuries to pursue. And now we can find our way um, around the water. And of course, with the aid of GPS. Now, let me jump forward a century. And some of you may recognize this famous photo. In the US, there was the moonshot of the Transcontinental Railroad. So this was a big idea. In fact, it came down to one person who was a American merchant really interested in connecting the east coast of the country to the west coast and built the railroad tracks to meet in the middle and both Robin who you heard from and myself have connections with Stanford University. You can see Stanford senior nailing the golden spike at the center of the picture. And he's the gentleman standing with the cane. And then he and his wife, Jane, actually then founded the university that we know and love today. So here's a very big moment of connecting different groups and using transportation, of course, manufacturing and the railroad infrastructure to then support economic growth, new business opportunities, and other important elements. I'm gonna now move forward even more in time and share another example of moonshots. Now, this is the early logo of ARPA, which is DARPA, a US government agency, sits under the Department of Defense. Their mission is high risk, high reward research. What they're looking to do is mobilize and put funding toward big ideas of the future. And many of these ideas have now been shared worldwide. And so if we talk about making the world a better place, we have funding from ARPA that became ARPANET, and that is the predecessor for the internet. I mentioned GPS that came out of direct funding from DARPA. And then we have ultrasound, we have a number of other major technological innovations that now are being used to support how we communicate, buy, um, transact, um, interact, all of these different elements here. And this agency helped to introduce a new model of R&D and ways of working, but it wasn't just them because there was also a sister group that was being funded in the late 1950s, and this is NASA. And this actually led to the understanding of the term moonshot where US President John F. Kennedy had some pressure from Russia, who's still making a little bit of trouble on the global stage today. And JFK first tells Congress and then to the American public at large, we choose to go to the moon. And we recognize this is gonna take time. You know, we're gonna do this in a decade, which is pretty aggressive. There was no discipline of aerospace engineering or aeronautics. We didn't have the same computer processing power. And you can see here in his quote, we do this not because they are easy, but because they are hard. And it's this energy, this idea that has really established the term moonshot, which is a sexy way I think to capture this big idea, but it led to a fair amount of major activity and the actual literal launching of you know, the rockets to the moon, which happened in what, 1969, has now been adopted more mainstream. And in fact, one of the more popular examples comes from Google. They have a moonshot factory called X for short. Not just X marks the spot, but that X is the mystery, represents the intersection of a number of many different areas for pursuing these ideas. And you can see here on your screen, X's focus to create radical new technologies that solve some of the world's hardest problems. What's their approach? And you can see one example process where they have the Venn diagram. So these are the three overlapping circles. And in the X team's view, huge problem. This has to be a problem that affects millions, even billions of people in the world. So they already have a magnitude. This is a lot of scale which makes it a big idea. 
bottom right, radical solution. What does this mean? It needs to be a solution that seems almost impossible today. So here's the language again that captures the definition or the essence of what is a moonshot. And then bottom left, breakthrough technology. Now this is Google's bias and also for X as well. They realize not all moonshots may need technology, but this is a bench strength that they can bring. And the way they phrase this is that the breakthrough technology can give a glimmer of hope for a solution that can exist within five to 10 years. So you have a longer time frame, and you can see their approach here for what defines the type of ideas that they want to pursue that is worthy of their resources and attention. As the last example that's also interesting, Amazon has been doing interesting work. And this has actually been a long journey for the company. You recognize possibly the mugshot for founder and recent CEO, Jeff Bezos of the company. This is a snippet from his 2018 letter to shareholders. And every year, Bezos would include his original letter from the first year of the company. And you can see some of the key phrases that he's continued forward where he recognizes it's all about the long-term. And you can see here comments around the power of wandering. They're creating a culture of builders, people who are curious, they're explorers, they like to invent. These are phrases that evoke that type of moonshot thinking, that you have the beginner's mind and that you are willing to keep trying, right? You can see in the bottom language here, it's guided by hunch, gut, intuition, recognizing this is a journey. So here is an example of a company embedding in the values of thinking big, of continuing to try, finding these outsized discoveries about being willing to explore. Now, this is something that has a growing body of knowledge, and there's different ways that companies and organizations can get to finding their moonshots. So I've been starting a book project with a good partner in crime, William Cockaine, and we've identified over 50 ways to build these moonshots. And just to tease you a little bit, and then uh, glad to hear the questions as part of our panel today, but there's a number of ways to do this. How do you create the mindset? How do you invest and fund moonshots? How do you help invent the future? What are the ways to prototype? How do you then make those big bets? What are the stepping stones to make it happen? So there's a number of different ways to get there. My hope is that I have helped introduce this concept, planted a seed for thinking big, and then I'm excited to hear more about the different ideas and examples that you have. So would love to stay connected and hear more about your ideas in this process. So back to you, Johanna. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tamara, for, for an exciting presentation. It's really easy to forget all the work that has been done previously and what amazing achievements that have been uh, <laughs> done. Like uh, you said, just exploring the, the sea and, and uh, building railways and going to the moon and more. So um, I would like to, to, to start with, um, would you have any recommendations for a moonshoot program um, and how to ident identify the challenges like CO2 reduction, um, if, if VIT manufacturing were to do that? Great question. And I think there's different ways to go about finding a program. And a few thoughts come to my mind. One, to tap into the ecosystem. Moonshots are the work of more than one group. It often takes multiple different types of skill sets and organizations to come together. And so to be very open to collaborative models and approaches, as one example, in the UK, there is a global technology center exploring the future of flight. And this includes Airbus, but also two dozen other partners looking at new technologies, Wings of Tomorrow, which is Airbus's signature program here, but other manufacturing and new materials and so forth. So you have these examples to draw on and you can see 
this is also multiple organizations trying to work together with the support of funding from the government, from other organizations. And so it's a way to try and build scale by bringing more than one group together. And then another area, and uh, I think this isn't done enough, which is how do we bring in more of the younger generation? They have to live the future we're creating. They also have some strong opinions about what this means for them. We're certainly seeing more vocal champions, mm -hmm. uh, not just Greta Thornburg out of Sweden, but also across the world in other communities. And they're gonna have ideas about their future in manufacturing, but also crossing over different industries. And I think this is part of the exciting time now where we have a number of new efforts with digital twins, with smart technologies, AI, the metaverse, right? That we don't always have to think in such a strict boundary when we say manufacturing, but we can bring in lessons, insights from these other sister areas, sectors, groups and communities. And I think that's gonna help get you to finding that program that makes sense and be willing to experiment too. Yeah, that, that, that's, it's really good to have those ideas and we will be very happy to uh, continue a collaboration with you um, for any uh, initiative around moon shoots. Now I also wanted to, to touch on, um, so does technology and innovation have social implication? Is it enough to develop technology or do we have a responsibility when it comes to the environmental and uh, social aspects? So, Robin. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's a great question, one I'd love to address, and I think I could actually combine it with the previous question about moonshots. I think we're always exploring and, you know, now we're leaving the planet, but yet I could say that, you know, one big moonshot is related to the ocean. We know more about, say, the surface of Mars and the moon than we do about our own ocean. Uh, this is a clear moonshot. We don't even understand the resources that are there, for example. So if we're talking about technology for good, I think this is a huge area that we need to be thinking about because just take, for example, deep sea mining. We don't even understand how this might influence the ecosystems, the biodiversity at the bottom of the ocean. So while we're developing the technology to enable us to say mine the deep sea, these polyglot things and whatnot, the issue is that when you start disturbing the sea floor, it releases all types of organisms that might not even be one meter away. And so I think while we have the technology to enable this, clearly we don't even understand what might that lead to in terms of say invasive species. You know, by this, when you start playing with the biodiversity and enabling through, you know, these different swirls that might go through the currents and so on, we don't even know where these organisms might end up. So I think it's, we need to think, we need to start also, we need to bring in the social sustainability aspect. But this is a, a huge challenge when we have so much related to say growth and scale and profitability. And, and so how do you bring in that social perspective? And I think that's why it gets back to what Tamar was just saying related to the younger generation and involving them and seeing the world through their eyes. Uh, so I think it's, it's how do we encourage, you know, starting I'd say with the social sustainability, starting with the use case, with the need, and then seeing, okay, which technologies should we develop or how could we combine them to fulfill those needs, as opposed to coming up with some fantastic technology and not really understanding the implications of how it might be used per se bad. Um, yeah. Mm. Thank you, Robin. No. Klaus, would you like to comment on uh, the social and environmental responsibility? Yeah, first of all, a big thank you, Damara and Robin, for your inspiring talks. I was really impressed by both of you. So thanks a lot for enriching our, our community and our session with this, with this really inspiring talks. And, uh, uh, you know, for us, uh, talking, uh, looking at the moonshot for us, really, as a as an innovation community, as a European innovation community, with uh, uh, a lot of industry partners, a lot of academia and research institutes, for us, the moonshot uh, methodology is for sure something we are seriously thinking on when it came especially to the decarbonization of industry, which is the, the main challenge uh, 
uh, we are facing uh, not only in Europe, all over the world, but our goal is really to support the, the European manufacturing industry in their transition towards the decarbonization of industry and making Europe really a role model for green and sustainable production. And there, for sure, the Moonshot, as I said, is for us a, a methodology. And I like very much dropping, uh, uh, your comment at the end to start really not with the technology, rather with the with sustainability, with the social or environmental sustainability. necessary. What is necessary? Reach these goals. Yeah? I like this very much and for sure we will this take into consideration. And as I said, we are just in the beginning. We are now in the second year of our, of our operations. It took us and it was really difficult under COVID to ramp up such a we are in fact a startup distributed all over Europe, but now we are, let's say, in a, in a cruising altitude where we can really push forward and show uh, uh, that we really can, can have impact. Yeah, and therefore, uh, 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 Tamara, your methodology on the moonshot and also, Robin, your thinking about the social and environmental sustainability. We should stay in contact. Yeah, and I have also, I've been thinking, isn't it possible that companies become more competitive if they, they are really focusing on social and environmental sustainability? Tamara, um, maybe? Sure, I, I'll uh, share some perspective and then of course, happy to hear other people's thoughts as well on this. Yes and no. I think an important consideration as we think about the future, especially with the lens of sustainability and ecosystem and environmental work, is that in the end, we all have to live in that future. So it doesn't make sense to compete and try and uh, wreck our chances and remove resources versus change our mindset and reframe the approaches we take. And particularly with moonshots, these are ideas, aims that are really big and bold and require us to think beyond our typical box. And so for me, you know, yes, there might be some healthy competition, but also a fair amount of new ways of working together. And I think that is meant to jumpstart new business models, new solutions, also new types of organizational structures to make that happen. And I, I would put a challenge out there. Sustainability is very important, but there is going to be other considerations to Robin's point around what we don't know we don't know that are going to emerge as we get closer for the future that we're building together. And it could be thinking about education. How do we not only manage to get through the pandemic, but also build in other ways and prepare how we can support each other, create a sense of community, keep our identity. Particularly, we've been hearing the scare around climate change, but communities escaping and finding better climates in the world too. And of course, that's gonna have implications, not just for the manufacturing industry, but food, other aspects of society and life. And how do we help support and build this better planet, both in terms of oceans, but even beyond? So. It's, it's going to be wonderful times ahead, and this is where, you know, beyond competition, getting us to just be open to all these different possibilities. Thank you. Robin, would you like to comment anything? Yes, no, I think uh, exactly as Tamara's bringing up here, we, it's, there's a lot of challenges and a lot of solutions, but I think, as she was pointing out, many new ways of working. And I think that's really interesting if we think about the ecosystems and so on. One of the slides that I didn't actually show today is this kind of transforming where we are going potentially from these very centralized hierarchical organizations to much more decentralized self-organizing networks. And then you could say, what really is competition in this kind of new form of organizing value creation? I mean, look at what's going on within with all these decentralized autonomous organizations. 
uh, coming along with the help of blockchain and cryptocurrencies, et cetera, and virtual worlds. I mean, we already have blockchain and Bitcoin created by these, you know, as these self-organizing networks. So I think I'd also like to challenge this, you know, we don't necessarily think we, we should be thinking differently about what a firm is as well and how value is created and think more in terms of these collaboration. Because again, as Tamara pointed out, it's like we have, you know, what is the future that we're building together and competition tends to be a zero sum game. Yeah, I mean, it has been so lovely to have you here today. A wonderful discussion and such wonderful presentations. Thank you. Really a, a super good, great thank you to, to both of you keynote speakers. Thank you to Klaus, yeah. to, to Cecil and Nina for participating in this innovation session. We're and thank you for a wonderful job organizing everything, yeah. Johanna. Super. Yeah. Very well done. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not on me. We have a, a, a support team yeah. behind us from EIT Manufacturing. So. Uh, I was just doing okay. the easy part here. So <laughs> thank you so much. And I thank feel you. quite confident looking forward that we are on the right track and I hope we will continue uh, even more uh, to, to collaborate and to, to create this, this uh, community. Super. Thank okay. you so much.